All right, let's get to what we're watching for in this matchup. Ted, looking at OU's defense against Tulsa's offense, what do you have your eye on? Well, you know, I I actually like Tulsa's offense quite a bit. Um, it's a throwback Kevin Wilson offense. You know, it's it's not overly complicated. Um, I can't wait to get – I, I want to get your opinion on the offensive line, but just generally speaking – just some of the stuff you're going to see in the run game, inside zone, split zone, a little bit of zone read, and that'll probably depend on who's playing quarterback. Um, they'll do some of that. Their uh, their biggest bread and butter though is the the counter play. Um, you know they'll pull the guard and the tight end who's off the ball in a little you know uh, slot or wing position. Also and, pull the center in the tight end. How about yeah, that? He's uncovered. They'll pull they'll pull the center. And I'm sure that's a call there with the front that they give, right? Yeah. Well, the way is if you've got a wide three on the backside, right? Instead of the center going all the way back and blocking back on the wide three, you just pull him and have him be the first puller on counter. He's the kick out guy in man on the line of scrimmage. Pretty Get simple. A little quicker. Yeah. Yeah. And you know, I think their running game, they do a good job with it, you know, against Washington. You know, they had some opportunities there. They were able to to chew up some yards. Now, they weren't breaking long runs or anything, but, like, in the box, they were able to create some levels, uh, you know, chew up some yards in the zone game. There was a couple times in the in the counter game where they, where they you know, kind of got to the perimeter, you know, whenever you had the, the edge guy wrong arm in it, and they would find a little bit of crease there. Sometimes, you know, if, if Presley was in, he'd just hit the gas and try and outrun the contain player and get around to the outside. So you've got to watch that with him. But, you know, I like it. Now, the problem for Tulsa is that it's it's so, like, vanilla and straightforward. And I think Oklahoma's going to be, like, just chomping at the bit against it. But, I mean, I think it's going to be uh, fun to watch it. Um, in the passing game, you don't get a whole lot. You get a bunch of, you know, pretty standard concepts, three by one. Um, the will run some boot out of three by one with the tight end and that, that little offset position off of the, the split zone look or the inside zone look. And you'll get the typical routes off of that. You'll get the comeback on the outside. They'll run like the over route behind it from the slot receiver. And then you'll get the drag on the backside uh, whenever they're running the boot out of a spread formation. Um, you'll get some, some double post out of them, which is, which is pretty typical out of three by one. And they like to run the, the China concept and they'll get to it out of a bunch of different looks. They'll do it out of two by two where the outside guy runs the little stop route and the inside guy runs the seven over the top of it. Whenever you get cover two, try and put those guys in some conflict and you'll also get it out of the offset back on the backside of three by one offset back will swing. And he'll be the flat guy. And then, you know, the the number one receiver will release inside and then run the seven again, uh, trying to create that conflict again out there on the outside. Um, you'll get the old mesh route, 98, with the unders and the dig in behind, which almost everyone in college football runs. You know, that's a that's an old Mike Leach special. Uh, Lincoln runs the, the heck out of it. Um, you know, just – Everyone, except for us, we don't run it anymore, um, which is which is kind of odd. But you'll get that. Um, you'll get the uh, – and you'll get it out of two by two, and you'll get it out of three by one as well. And splits will pretty much tell you what's going to happen on that with the wide receivers. Um, you'll get the uh, the indie – I call it indie, the, the double square in where the guys go five, seven yards, and then it's like a hard square in. And you'll get it on the on the back side of that. On the other side, you'll just get like a hard square out, and then a takeoff on the outside guy. Um, you'll add a two by two. You'll still get the ninety eight. They'll run some sprint pass. Uh, you know, with that tight end, he'll be in that little. Uh, it's a slot. It's not a wing, but most people call it a wing. He's outside the tackle and off the off the ball like a yard, and you can tell by his split if they're running counter or if he's protecting or if he's running zone, like if he's off the ball more, he's coming across the formation. If he's up tight, uh, you know, he's blocking right there. Uh, they'll max protect with him in that spot, but they'll also 
you know, he'll block the edge and they'll run sprint to him, but they'll also run sprint away. So you get some of the sprint pass with the common, common routes on that kind of the levels you'll get the underneath and then the guy in behind. And sometimes it's a comeback with the guy in behind on the sprint pass. Uh, you'll get empty and they'll run, you know, some basic stuff out of empty. You'll get, you know, like the the tunnel screen to the two receiver side, and then on the three receiver side, they'll run the bubble to try and get some some guys from the middle of the formation to expand out. Um, couple of couple of snaps of Max Pro against Washington kept the tight end and then offset in, and you're getting the three wide receiver routes out there. Did um, you uh, on the on some of the Max Pro snaps? Did you see what the edge guy from Washington did to the tight end? Just ran right through him. <laughs> you know? Don't do it, people. Don't have tight ends, pass block, edge players one on one. Don't do it. Well, they had oh, one of them that had the the tight end and the back blocking him, and neither one of them got him. It was uh, and he looked like practice dummies. But you know, you'll get out of whenever they go max pro, they'll run like you know because it's only three guys getting out. They'll run the double, uh, double post to try and buy the middle safety, and then like the the takeoff, like the inside angle takeoff to be able to throw it deep in the middle of the field and try and let him run under it. Um, you'll run like in this slot. They'll just have, I call it get open where he's just up the field, 10, 12, 14 yards, and then working away from leverage. And it's just trying to trying to throw and catch there. Um, that's pretty much what you're going to get. Um, as far as personnel, uh, curious to see what we get at quarterback. If we get the Braxton kid, you know, he's more athletic. You'll probably see some some more move the pocket stuff and a little bit of zone read, quarterback run stuff. Um, if you get the uh the fuller kid who I thought was was actually okay. Um against Washington, Williams was the quarterback that played and they had stuff in the passing game. He just couldn't find it. You know, I when they ran the mesh ninety eight, it was open pretty much every time. He just couldn't he, he never ID'd it. Couldn't, I don't know if he was just worried about the rush and, and the vision was bad, but uh, Fuller's a little bit better throwing the ball for them. If you see him number 10, I think the backs are, I think they're adequate, but they're undersized. So they're smaller guys. And whenever you, whenever you combine smaller guys with what their run game is, it's not a great mix. I think you you'd prefer, especially you're going to run counter, you know, that gap scheme stuff. You'd like to have a bigger running back to try and run through some of that stuff and, and some of the zone stuff as well. But what they've got is what they got. Uh, Braylon Presley five, he'll be in there and they'll move him around the formation. He'll play in the slot. He'll play out of the backfield. Um, Watkins, you know, 23 is probably the bigger back that they have. He's just like a 205 pounder. So still small. Um, tight ends you're not going to get much they're just mainly blockers 47 is typically the guy they have in that's going to move across the formation um wide receiver haven't seen anyone really that worries you right now leads me to believe that uh venables is probably going to be ultra aggressive and let his defensive backs cover some and really dial up the pressure on the interior but um offensive line i'd like to get your thoughts i think they're obviously i mean for for the caliber of player that they have i and this isn't a this isn't a, a dig at them i think it's actually a compliment because it's way more difficult than than maybe it should be but they block the right guys i feel like they're on the right guys every time and you don't have like free runners into the backfield you know, with a bunch of tackles for loss and stuff like that. Now they're going to get beat and they got beat quite a bit by, by Washington guys. But I mean, I, I think it's going to be difficult now, depending on what Venables throws at them. You may have guys like messing up left and right, but I feel like they do a pretty good job of getting on the right guys. They do some pretty good stuff on the inside run, but I mean, that's, that's pretty much what I saw at Tulsa's offense. Yeah. O-line wise. I, out of all the guys, 57, the left tackle, I think is the best player, right? Moves the best, has good athleticism, not a ton of size, right? I think Venables is going to attack the right side of their line, right? If he's going to dial it up, I think right guard, right tackle, especially right tackle, 
right? Daryl Simpson, a name that a lot of OU fans know. I think he he's just he just does not change direction well. If you're gonna attack if you're gonna attack a portion of that offensive line with blitz concepts or twists, that's where I'd do it. Just because I do not think that right side redirects particularly well. Like make those guys make those guys move, pass off twists, adjust the blitzes. If you're gonna attack them, I think that's where you do it. Yeah. No, I, I think you're you're probably right. I'm curious to see how Venables plays it though. Um I, I you know, defensively we should be able to control this game playing just base stuff. But I don't know if if he wants to throw some things out there to to have some some Big Twelve teams chasing ghosts a little bit or if he if he still feels like there's there's some exotic stuff that they need to work on to get it really tuned up. I like personally, I think they need work in their like their three man rush stuff up front. I thought the three man rush stuff was good, but when you're dropping eight guys in zone, we've got to be better. I mean, there's it is there is no way you can justify a guy being wide ass open whenever you drop eight players in zone coverage. Now, if they're going to throw something underneath on a get open, like timing stuff, you may hit that, but my God, we've got to be able to relate to guys way better in the three man rush stuff. Yeah, I'm with you. And we'll see, we'll see what it looks like, right? Probably more Peyton Bowen in this game. Heard Venables at the yeah. presser talk about Harrington still being banged up, right? We pointed out on the broadcast that guy was, he was not moving well, especially in the second quarter. Wasn't moving great in the second half. I am still, I'm shocked. SMU's coaching staff, how you don't see that from the box and attack that guy, it's coaching malpractice. I don't, it's insane. It's insanity, especially in the second quarter. I'll never understand it, but. I was worried he was going to get hurt. Like, I mean, I know he was hurt, but he was so hobbled that he was, he was so tentative around the pile and stuff, like trying to avoid. Uh, I was like, either either flip it on get past it or get out you know they, they didn't even throw a bubble at him like mm-hmm. to say hey go get off a of block and make a tackle like didn't test it. it's insane it's insane but that's that's last week so i am so you've got harrington banged up mccola still banged up so it it seems like more peyton bowen right at that cheetah spot that's I hope McCullough can go. Uh, Venable said he's hopeful. Now, I don't know. He why was why push out. it for Tulsa, though, is my question. Yeah. You know, he, he was dressed out, not taped or anything. It wasn't going through anything, but he was out there in pads, and he was walking around okay. Um, I don't know. I, I, I would say the only reason is he needs work. And right. if he's able to go and you can get him a game, a full game of, playing cheetah that would go a long ways for him but you know if he's not up Peyton Bowen and Reggie Pearson yeah we'll see right I'm the ultimate hey if you're healthy enough to play you play guy so we'll see but I think they'll be smart with it right yeah. well but you got anything else oh use defense Tulsa's offense I don't think so I think that for me that pretty much covers it again I very straightforward offense from Kevin Wilson, I mean, they don't do a whole lot of things, which leads me to believe that Oklahoma defensively should have a really good game. I'm with you. All right, let's talk about what we're watching for for OU's offense and Tulsa's defense. So first thing, uh, it it's not a typical road game, but it's still a road game, right? So just handling the mechanics of the operation on the road, right? Uh, handing all of that, right? And that that starts with, and I know they don't have to get on a flight for this game, but getting on the bus, making the trip, like everything that goes with that, you got to handle all of that, but interested to see what the crowd noise is like, right? Maybe Tulsa fans show out in a big way. Mm-hmm. Right? And you are dealing with a little crowd noise and, and you have to handle that as an offensive line, as an entire offense. We'll see. This is kind of a unique road experience that OU is going on, but looking at the defense, Four two five defense from from Tulsa. They have a little bit out of 
you know, kind of a three man front look and odd front look, which leads me to my first thing to watch. Find number zero. Ben Kapinski, you're going to mostly find him at an edge spot, right? I think he's their best player on defense, but they do float him around sometimes in a three man front. Ted, you and I would call this a spinner look, right? And it reminds me, do you remember how Jim Knowles used Brock Martin that year? They were really good on defense at Oklahoma State. Yep. Was that two years ago? You remember how they'd float him in the middle of the defense? Yep. It's exactly, it's exactly what they're doing with Kapinski. So whether you are, you know, an, an offensive guard, an offensive tackle, a running back, like you got to be able to find zero. He's a down lineman. And he needs to be treated accordingly in every run concept you have and in every pass protection concept you have. Like that guy is a down guy. You don't need to be leaving the running back one-on-one -on -one with zero. If they do that, that's bad scheme. That's bad ball. Yeah. So that's the first thing is find zero. And then he's, you know, coming off the edge, he's got good hands, good explosiveness, you know, plays with violence. So uh, Ostrowski 48, you better put your hard hat on. That dude is going to hit, yeah. but you straight in the face <laughs> and he looks strong as hell. He is man. It's so funny. He's stiff a little bit, but my goodness, is he strong? He looks like he can deadlift a house when you're watching <laughs> I'm, I'm him on sure tape. He can. I'm yeah, sure he can. he's got the he, he's definitely got the DNA. That's for sure. Yeah, his dad, right? Dad's a Tulsa Hall of Famer, right? Mm -hmm. NFL guy. Um, you know, bad dude. It it runs in the veins. Now he's not quite the athlete his dad was, but both of those guys on the edge, like they use their hands well. They're really physical, and so. Whether you're running it or throwing it, like you you better be ready to bring it with 48 and zero. Right. It's a it's gonna be a weird matchup for the tackles, right? Rouse and Guyton, you know, looked apart these big guys, and then you've got these two guys that are just like, hey, you want to get in a fight? <laughs> like you're that's... telling me that that Blake Smith needs to wear that little extra helmet thing, the uh the concussion sleeve. The guardian the cap? Head. Yeah. It would be wise. When he's lined up over 48. Dude, he's going to be running that split zone, buddy. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. So those edge guys and yeah, they can, you know, they can play a little bit. I have not been overly impressed with anyone on the interior. I think the guy that flashes the most to me is 99. But there's a couple snaps where you're just like, damn, he is bullying that guy straight back into the quarterback. So if there's one guy to watch in the interior, I think it's 99 from a, from a coverage standpoint, Teddy, how, how do you like yourself? Some deep cover three, my friend. Hey, my opinion is if you are a good defense, you can play cover three to anything. Okay. Well, that's what they do now to their credit. They try to disguise by showing too high and they rotate the three. Now the thing, and this is something you've talked about quite a bit with OU's defense. Their underneath zone coverage stinks. There is an incredible amount of space between their deep third players and their backers and the hook players. Like an insane amount of space. Dude, their deep third players, you know the old adage like, hey, stay deeper than the deepest? Yeah. They take that very, very seriously, dude. <laughs> Oh, like I mean, insanely seriously, there is, there should be, and I know what I'm about to say. Oh, you fans. I know that how this is going to sound. There should be a ton of money made in the intermediate passing game and in the middle of the field. The voids are enormous, enormous, especially with some of the RPO stuff that Levy likes to do. Like if those backers, if there's even more space, if they, suck up even more on some of those run fakes. There's going to be so much space. Now that's if they do what they've been doing, right? I figured if they did it against Washington, they're going to do it against Oklahoma, but we'll see. I, I will be shocked. And I know you want to establish the run after what happened last week. And you want to get the offensive line, some confidence heading into heading into the Cincinnati game, which by the way, I've started watching them. Whoa. 
Whoa. Yeah, they're going to be good. Whoa. That's going to be a game. Did not see that coming. Whoa. We'll get to that next week, but whoa. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I think I'd be shocked if they don't have a huge day throwing the football with just how much space there is between those deep third players and and their underneath zone coverage. Dude, it's like it's like borderline unbelievable how much space there is. Well, I if if you can't take advantage, they're gonna play it a lot. You got to be able to chew it up. Um you got to be able to run against it too because I you can drop back pass against cover three and have a lot of success. Um if they're underneath guys aren't great. But if you can run the ball against it too, the play action stuff just totally kills cover three. Yeah. And one thing, like a high level thing I for Dylan Gabriel, I'm interested in seeing is, you know, how can he manipulate that middle safety with his eyes? Yeah. Right. That that's high level quarterback play. And that's kind of what I expect from him. Can he move that middle safety with his eyes and then hit some deep shots, right? Kind of in that backside seam, right? That's, that's what I expect from him. Right, that's the level of play I expect from him. We'll see if he gets those opportunities. But that's just something to keep an eye on. We could go through your favorite cover three beaters, but we don't have enough time. Oh, uh, there's there's all kinds of them, man. Cover, uh, four verticals, flat and slant, uh, all kinds of creative wheel routes, double moves. Like we haven't seen any double moves on the outside, like a slant and go, or you know, like a like you're working a comeback and go. We should have all kinds of stuff. Yeah. Now, one thing I'm saying, like, hey, you you should be able to really – and I'm talking throws like 15, 20 yards down the field. There's so much space. Mm-hmm. There's so much space. But also, their defensive backs on tape, they do not tackle well, man, especially number 11. I mean, there's just – there's a lot of missed tackles. And so, we we didn't see – a Probably ton has a of lot the, to do with all of the space underneath. I mean, that's difficult. It, it makes all those cleanup tackles really hard. Yeah, but I I do think I would expect some bubbles, some of the quick throws on the outside, right? Make those defensive backs come up and make tackles in space on our wide receivers, right? Also kind of see if they can get off some blocks out there on the edge, right? Kind of going back to what we saw in the Arkansas State game. Just, hey, what are yeah. you made of here on the outside? I think we'll see – I'd be surprised if we didn't see quite a bit of that. And then one thing – and you, you, this is a game, like you mentioned on defense, you, you want to put some stuff on tape, right, that makes Cincinnati and everyone from that point on start thinking a little bit. Washington scored on multiple reverses in that game. Tulsa – what's the best way to put it? Tulsa's defense doesn't have a ton of recovery speed. Yeah. So, and now to those credit, to their credit, they play hard, man. They fly around, right? They play with really good effort, but there was a couple of times where Washington just caught them really over pursuing. And one of the reverses, the guy literally walks in and I do mean walks into the end zone at the very end. <laughs> so I, I'm interested to see if we get some misdirection stuff like that from Oklahoma and, you know, reverses, maybe a double reverse, something like that to, uh, to see if they can they can uh, get Tulsa over pursuing a little bit, but also just put it on tape moving well, forward. I if I'm an offensive coordinator and I see a team have success on reverses, first series maybe the first play of the game, you know, whenever they're all amped up to pursue, and you know they worked on reverse stuff all week, coached it, got yelled at about it. So you show them a reverse right out of the gate, and it's a pass, reverse pass. Ooh, I like that. Okay. Yeah. Anything – you got anything? Oh, use offense? Tulsa's defense? I, you know, again, this is going to be about uh, Oklahoma. I'm – we should be able to have success, you know, across the board. I'm looking for the offensive line to bounce back, and I'm curious to see what personnel we see. I – um, running back. Yeah, I'm curious to see what left guard looks like. Yeah, yeah. Like, point. does Troy ever get the start? Right? I I think that's that's a big storyline going in. But as hard as I was on those guys last week, which they deserved, by the way, I I expect them to bounce back in a big way. 
and they need they need confidence going into Cincinnati, man. I'm telling you. Dante Corleone and Juwan Briggs for the Bearcats. Other than Sweat and Murphy for Texas, it's the best duo of interior defensive linemen they're going to play all season long. Yeah. And Corleone is like legit, legit. Like, hey, we got to maybe have a column of what we're going to run in the run game when he's on the field versus when he's off the field. Like that legit. Yeah. So I would really like to see this offensive line play at a high level, right? Bounce back and get some positive momentum heading into next week where they're going on the road into an extremely hostile environment, right? And they're going to have to play against a couple NFL players. Mm -hmm. So that's what need, need to bounce back, need to play at a high level. I love hearing how pissed off they are about the way that they played. They should be. Tulsa, Tulsa's defensive front should, should not be able to dictate anything in this game. Yeah. So yeah. my hope is when we recap this thing on Sunday, I'm singing their praises saying, hey, they did exactly what they should do against that, against that defense. Yeah. Well, yeah, I hope that's the case. And I'm glad they got a couple of edge guys that are, that are, you know, a, a, a decent test you know and smu was too they had a, they had a pretty good defensive line so um yeah cincinnati's I was th is that going to be other than texas the most difficult game we play this year i'll tell you right now i watched i've watched every snap they played right i, I i'm no longer a player i can look ahead to the next <laughs> opponent yeah cincinnati can beat you yeah if they don't show up and play well especially with how Nippert's going to be rocking for that game. Oh, yeah. Size across the board. They can they can beat OU. Like the you, – you're thinking like height, weight, size. Oh, they're coming from the group of five. They're – you know, we're going to have a big physical advantage. No. They they got size, speed. They got, they got it everywhere. Dual threat quarterback. Yeah, well – we better we better get uh we better get rolling in this their, Tulsa game. Uh, their uh, outside linebacker body, right? They play they play a four man front, but it's an odd structure. Their outside linebacker body, two fifty. Corleone three twenty. Briggs three hundred. They, they've had great outside edge guys at Cincinnati over the past like five or six years. It's great. Wait till you see Pitts tied in. Try to pass pro this guy. <laughs> You're going to love it. All right. Well, that's enough on Cincinnati. We're focused on Tulsa. Let's get to call your shot. We asked you guys the number one thing you'll be watching for in OU Tulsa. This first one comes from Drew Gastineau. He says, offensive line play. Our offense goes as they go. Interior has got to pick it up. Drew, I think. I think everyone under everyone that listens to this podcast understands that I uh, I agree with you, sir. Yeah, we need it. I mean, that, it, it's frustrating. And I again, I know SMU was was solid there on the defensive line, but uh, coming into this thing, we were hoping that the offensive line was going to be one of the stronger units on the entire team, and I still think they can be, but we got to get rolling quick. Yeah, and I'm. I'm interested to see how Beatenbo rotates those guys on the interior, right? The What's tackles. I, I still think you start Savion, right? Because if you don't, you start worrying about, okay, like how is he going to handle it? And not to say that he doesn't have good mental toughness or anything like that, but he, he's undoubtedly your more talented guy at left guard. Mm-hmm. And this is a game where he can build confidence. So it, it's a delicate balance, man. Now, Bean sure, Bro doesn't care much about your feelings. Right? I mean, you're going to need him. At, That's the thing is, decide. I'm thinking about Cincinnati. I'm thinking about Texas. I'll tell you right now, Troy Everett, if he's got to block Corleone, he's getting tossed around, man, straight up. It's just It is what it is, man. It is what it is. So you need Savion to build some confidence in this game, right? Get back on track and be ready to go for next week. 
Now, if he gets out there and doesn't play well again, you got to do what you got to do, right? Yeah. I mean, but and that's that's assuming he's having a good week of practice. He's doing everything that he needs to do to earn Bill's trust leading into this game. Does that make sense? Yep, one hundred percent. But yep. yeah, all right. This other one comes from Coffee Jedi. <laughs> what a name! He's looking for mistake-free football. Really want a clean game after last week. That's number one. Also want to see any package with Jackson Arnold that doesn't involve a QB sneak. Yeah, yeah, that's that's interesting. Well, I mean, that goes back to the personnel thing. Um, what are we going to see from the younger guys getting in, the wideouts, the running backs, and also Jackson Arnold? You know, I, whether it's uh, – I'd like to see us get to a point in this game where he gets a lot of run in the second half, but, you know, also if they're bringing him in off the bench, which, you know, I don't know. I don't know necessarily if, if it's worth it, if you're just going to run quarterback power, I mean, which I, it's got to be a, like a decoy thing. It has to be, it has to be. It, I don't, I, I'm i all for getting him snaps, keeping him engaged, right? Keeping him happy, whatever, however you want to phrase it, even though he doesn't seem like that type of guy to me. Right. I would prefer you just let the guy play. Let yep. him play quarterback. Maximize his strengths. I, I've said it. I said it on the last episode. I'll say it again. QB power, that ain't it for him. That's not his strength. I mean, he's not a small guy by any means, but he's not a big bruising guy. Like he, he's a five-star dual threat quarterback, not a in between the tackles running back. Yeah. You know, if you're going to put him on the field, let him play. Agree. Let him rip, let it rip, baby. Come on. Yep. But Hey, we'll see how it goes. Right. I love Venables was like, why would red shirt? What are you guys talking about? He's like, no way. <laughs> it's it's our backup, backup quarterback. quarterback. Yeah. <laughs> 